when you speak about Purim, the Gemara cites many Amoroim who had spoken about various issues regarding the Agarito, Agaric Midrashim about certain events or the individuals who are key players in regard to Purim bring about the miracle. The Morse cites Rav Shul Bar Nachmoni Poshach lo pischo lahe parshat miyocho He would open the lecture by citing a verse, a posuk. Tachas ha natsutz yalev rosh. In the place of the natsutz, which is something which is similar to a briar bush, in its place grows a barosh, a certain type of tree. Tachas ha sirpod yal hadas, in the place of something more similar to the prickly branch, what grows there? A myrtle, hadas. Tachas ha natsutz, who's the natsutz? Homan Arosho. Shoosa atzmo avodazoro, he defined himself. The chsiv cites a verse. Yalev Rosh. Well, who's the Rosh? This other species of tree grows in the place of this briar bush. Zemorchai. Shinikro Rosh il Cholapsomim. He's the primary of all the ingredients <coughs> of spices. Shinemar. As it says in the Parsha, Ato Kachel Chobsomim Rosh, Morjuror. You should take the primary spice, which is called Morjuror, Meyer. Umetargemino, the Aramaic translation of Morjuror, is Mori Dachyo, Mordchai. So therefore, in the place of the Natsuts, grows the Barosh, the, the word Rosh, primary, that's alludes to Mordechai. Mordechai is looted through the primary ingredient of the anointing oil. Because this spice had to be added to the, to the oint, anointing oil to anoint the Mishkan, to anoint the vessels of the Mishkan, to anoint the Mizbeach, the menorah, the Shulchan, the beams, the vestments that the Kohanim wore, the Kohanim themselves, Aaron and his children were not qualified to officiate unless they were first anointed with the anointing oil. It's only anointing oil if it has this primary spice in it. So the question is, what is Mordechai's relevance to the anointing oil? Evidently he has, because he's alluded, the Torah alludes, the Mordechai, which is the, is the primary spice, this is Moridachio, that's Mordechai. The Gemara tells us in Brochus that a name always alludes to the destiny of a person. For instance, Rus HaMovio, Ruth the Moabite, was the grandmother of Dovin Melech. Why was her name Rus? How was, what, what lies with the name Rus? That she will have a grandson, who's Dovin Melech, was her grandson, he will say to Hashem with song and praise. So that was part of her destiny. David was meant to be her grandchild, which is Tilim. That's all the praise and the song of David. That's Tilim. Mordechai. Why is his name Mordechai? His name was Mordechai. Because it was destined that he should be the equivalent of the Shemina Mishcha, the anointing oil. Now, what relevance does he have to anointing oil? You know, very often, it's like we're discussing, there's a problem. Today, there's a problem. Now, what do you do with a problem? Sometimes you can take a problem and you could actually utilize it and really 
advance yourself because you appreciate the problem, you know what to do with the problem. Other people, they just wallow in the problem and they drown in the problem and they're beside themselves. They, know, they don't know where to turn. The Gemara tells us that the removal of the ring that Ahasuerus had given to Haman, which was an indication he was able to seal the letters with the decree to annihilate every man, woman, and child, the effect and impact that had on Klal Yisrael was greater than 48 prophets and seven prophetesses. With all their rebuke and their admonishment, whatever they said, relatively speaking, was quit falling on deaf ears. When the ring was given, which gave Haman full control that he could do whatever he wants with the Jews to bring about Chas Hashem, the final solution, it changed the equation. All of a sudden we woke up. We realized we're at a different level now. Now, do we survive now? What do we do? We understand, what do we do now? We can bemoan our fate. There's no way to escape because as it says, Ahasuerus ruled the world supreme. There wasn't any way you could go. There was nowhere to hide. So what do you do? Mordechai, being a member of the Sanhedrin, being the leading Torah sage of the generation, he led them in what they were supposed to do. He gave them understanding. Where does the problem lie? Where did it start? How do we resolve it? What's the resolution? And he led them to do tshuva. And they upgraded many of the things where they were lagging, where they were failing. As the Gemara says, tefillin wasn't worn. Many Jews, it was weak. Torah study was weak. It, their spiritual needed quite a bit of upshoring. He's the one who did it. And he led them in tshuva. So what did Mordechai do? He galvanized Klal Yisrael and he led them to be the Jews they were supposed to be. And as a result of that, it was an apachu. There was, a, there was an overturn of the decree. Rather than us being destroyed, Amalek was destroyed. So what did he activate them? He gave them an appreciation for who they were and who Hashem is to be able to maximize on their abilities. And that made the difference. Now, the Mishkan, when it was built, it was built to specification. It was infused with the kavano, with the intent that it was supposed to be. The vestments were made, everything. Aaron and his children qualify as Kohanim. But if they wouldn't have been anointed with the anointing oil, or the Mishkan wouldn't have been anointed with the anointing oil, and the beams wouldn't, it's just a beautiful edifice. It has no relevance to activating the forces and Hashem entering into it. That's only if you meet all the criteria. But what was what we call the Makkah Bepatish? What was the final touch that it needed? It had to be anointed with anointing oil. Without it, all it's a physical entity. Regardless of how innate it is and whatever it may be, it means nothing. So just as the anointing oil, and what was the primary ingredient in the anointing oil? Is the more dro, which is more idachio. That's what made the difference. Whether it activates, whether it impacts, when it brings about this change, Mordechai is, has, the same, he's, has the same quality. He made the difference. Only because he had the ability of leadership and the tzaddik that he was, and whatever he understood, and how we processed the failings, and what had to be corrected, and what had to be strengthened, that brought about the Ness. And that made Klal Yisrael fully functional. As a Klal Yisrael, to bring about the Ness of Purim, which was the Na'apachu, that we destroyed Amalek, rather than we, Chas Hashem, being destroyed. Tachas hasirbo tale vashti. Tachas vashti erishor. In the place of vashti, who she was the wife, she was the queen. Bas benoshel nevuchadnetzar rosha. She was the granddaughter, the great granddaughter, or the granddaughter of nevuchadnetzar, the one who destroyed the base of Migdosh. Shesora fidoso base Hashem. Yalla hadas. Hadasu Esther at Sadekis. Shinikras Hadaso. Esther was called Hadaso. Shinemar vi omen es Hadaso. 
Now, there's a famous word from the morale. We all know that Anochi has the The Torah says, Hashem says, I will go into concealment. And the Gemara tells us, where do we find Esther is alluded to in the Torah? Esther, Anochi has the Rastepanai. I will go into concealment. That's an allusion for Esther. Now, the period of time that Purim took place at was between the first and second Beis HaMikdosh. We were in Golos. We were in Golos Bovel. We still didn't return. The Shechina revealed miracles no longer existed. The only revealed miracle which happened after this period of time was Hanukkah, which took place during the Second Temple period, during the time of the Yavonim, the Greeks. So Esther, what happened during this period of time, we were in Golos, this is Hestaponim. Hashem is in concealment. The miracle of Purim, had it happened, if you read the script, the Jews were lucky that, that Esther happened to be a Jewess. She happened to have been the niece of Mordechai, who was the leader of the Jews. And Mordechai happened to overheard certain things. And he was able to inform his niece, who shared this with the king, and had it immediately recorded in his chronicles, that Mordechai Yehudi saved the life of the, of the king, and so on and so forth. And Haman makes a gallows, 50 amos, and when he goes to share with, inform Rosh he wants to have Mordechai hanged on that gallows, that night he couldn't sleep, and he read through his chronicles, and he said to him, uh, by the way, was this Mordechai uh, the Jew, was he ever rewarded? He said, no. So when he comes in, he says, what would you do to a person who deserves this and that? And he thought he was speaking about him. And it turns out he has to parade Mordechai through, through the capital city with the, the honor of a what? Of a king. It's unheard of. But you know, these things happen. A lot of things happen. One thing, two things, six things you could attribute to, these things happen, happenstance, coincidental. But when you see many things fall into place and a pattern and a picture begins developing, this is, things are, not, things are happening. But it's not happenstance. It's Hashem behind the scenes directing it exactly how it happened the way it's supposed to happen. That's why it's happening. Well, of course, Hummer was killed because he fell on Esther when she was in her bed and Ahasuerus was there. Such a level of, of, of audacity, of, of, of defiance, of insubordination. Of course he deserves to be killed. But who pushed him on the bed? How did he fall on the bed? So the Gemara tells us, Amalek pushed him on the bed and, and Ahasuerus was enraged. And it was all choreographed like you can't believe. And only HaKadosh Baruch Hu could choreograph it to such a way that every detail falls into place exactly. And this is all not revealed miracle. And that's the reason why we find all the Megillos, the name of Hashem is mentioned in them. Megillus Esther, the name of Hashem is not mentioned. Why? Hester upon him. Because it was concealment. God was not obvious. If you see the full picture, then you see the hand of God. If you don't, then you don't see the hand of God. Therefore, the halacha is, there's a question, if you leave out one word of the Megillah, one letter of the Megillah, one does not fulfill his obligation. Every Jew has an obligation to read the Megillah. There's a question by Kriya Torah, do you have an obligation to read the Parsha Sashavua from the Torah? So the Balkori is your representative. So we say Shomei Kone, like Kiddush, when we hear the words, it's like we read. Well, no. The obligation of the weekly reading is to read in the public, in a public setting, in a minion. We ha have an obligation to be present, but do you have to hear every word? You don't have to hear every word. But Mikra Megillah, the reading of Megillah, every Jew has an obligation to read that Megillah, to read that script. So therefore, when the Balkari reads, we have to hear every word he reads. If you miss one word, you miss one letter, one does not fulfill his obligation. Now, why? And it's from the first letter to the last letter. You have to hear the whole story. You have to reflect on the whole story. Do you know why? 
because you only see the hand of Hashem. If Mordechai and Esther, who were the authors of the Megillah, they didn't leave anything out. They included every event, every nuance of event which took place, they understood, they included in the Megillah. That information was included. Why did they include it? The Gemara says, what is Megillah? What is Purim? Pirsumi Nisa. When we read the Megillah, we, there's an obligation to publicize the miracle. How do we publicize it? By reading the Megillah. So that means every detail in the Megillah is the basis for publicizing the miracle. That means you all, but, but it's hest upon him. But it's concealed. The answer is, if you see every detail, it, it's no longer concealed. Then it becomes obvious. There's no other way to read it, to see it, to process it. That's the reason why you have to hear every word and every letter from the first word to the last word for that reason. Exactly that. Since they included that within the Megillah, and Megillah is presuming Nisa, is publicizing the miracle, the only way you have an appreciation for what took place is you have to hear everything from beginning to end. Otherwise, you missed it. You know, it's like you have a very sophisticated piece of equipment and every screw and every component has to be put in place. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You have a million three hundred sixty-five thousand pieces, and you left out one. I said, it doesn't make it. it shouldn't work. But I just left out one component. Ninety-nine point nine nine. It's all there. The answer is, if you don't have them all there, it doesn't work. That's the way. That's the way the the piece of equipment works. If you hear the whole story, it's no longer has to upon him. Then you see it. Otherwise, say, where's God? Every detail is crucial for it to resonate, to appreciate what took place. It's from the beginning to the end. Therefore, there's an ob- the Gemara has a question. On rabbinical holidays, we say Hallel. Hanukkah is a rabbinical holiday. We say full Hallel. So the Gemara says, so why in Purim don't we say Hallel? The Megillah is Esther, right? We say we read the Megillah. Hanukkah, we light the menorah. So each one has its mitzvah. But on Hanukkah, and besides lighting the menorah, which is presuming Nisa, which we revealed, publicized the miracle, we read, the, we say Hallel. We sing the praises of Hashem. So I pour him, the Gemara asks, why don't we sing his praises with Hallel? So Rav Nachman says, Kriyosa Zuhi Leila. When you read the Megillah, it's the equivalent of saying the Hallel. You are saying the Hallel. Now, how is reading the Megillah saying the Hallel? Hallel, you sing praises. You feel thankful, you express yourself. Very often, when you say something, that allows you to feel that expression gives you that sense of gratitude by singing the praises. The Megillah is written in such a way, when you read that Megillah, or you listen to that Megillah, it is impossible not to be touched the equivalent of Hallel even more than that. Therefore, they felt there's no reason to legislate Hallel on this one. Even though it's the ultimate value because we could have all been annihilated. There wouldn't be one Jew left. But when you appreciate that and you see how that was brought about, that we do exist, despite everything, on internalizing that, when that resonates, the, what you feel you have and the attachment you have is the will of the Hallel. So the reading in the Megillah is the Hallel. That's singing God's praises. Hashem Lashem, quoting this Posuk, and Hashem will have renown the Mikro Megillah. Mikro Megillah, that's that Hashem will have a shame. Renown. You know, you look at the world, you go to a botanical gardens, you see the various species of fruits and vegetables and plants. It's amazing, the beauty. People say, where's God? You know, you go to a, a birdhouse, 
where they have every species of exotic birds, the beauty of the plume and the, the shape. It's amazing what they have, the beauty. Where's God? Could they, the best artist in the world, who, the greatest mess, could they replicate this? Could they replicate a sunset? Hashem's sunset? But where's God? And people ask that question. We've turned, uh, overturned every stone, we didn't locate him. The mitzvah of Megill, of Chris Megillah, Voya Lashem, Voya Hashem Lashem. Zumikur Megillah. Hashem will have renown. That's the reading of the Megillah. When you read that Megillah, Hashem will have renown. Of course, it's impossible to deny his existence when you read those facts and you read them correctly. Person says, you know, I've read the Megillah. I'm not so excited about it. <laughs> Look, Korah stood at Sinai. And Hashem says, nobody will ever question your authenticity, Moshe. You are my spokesman. Korach mutinied with this whole community. They were there. You understand? If you have an open mind, of course, you can close your eyes, you don't see the light. If you choose because of your arrogance to turn your back, I will not talk to him. Okay? Does that mean to say he, he has nothing to say? He has to, what, plenty to say. You, you don't want to talk to him. I will not listen. Okay, so you're not listening. Korach heard it, saw it, but because his ego couldn't tolerate that his cousin was chosen over him and Aaron was chosen over him. He said, Moshe, you can't be the real thing. God couldn't have said what you said, but God said, I'm a spokesman. I understand what he said, but I, I have an issue with that. Okay? Because there's no way God couldn't have appreciated who I am because I know who I am. That, that was the arrogance of, of Korach. Same thing. Voyel Hashem Lashem. It's like a person goes to the Seder. A person has a PhD in physics, never valued, you know, loves his parents. He was raised, but he never had a, a true... Jewish education. He said a bunch of, bunch of uh, rhymes. Chagadio, the stick, the dog, the cat, the, the goat, the this, the water, the fire. So it's a bunch of, you know, it's for children. If you're a sophisticated intellectual, it's not for us. Sure. What do you know? You know? If you don't have a microscope, do you know what, what, what the microscope reveals? If you had the Torah education, maybe you'd understand all these are only symbolisms. But you know, you're into your arrogance. You're passing judgment. Okay? Same thing. The Megillah, if you read it right and you focus on it from the beginning till the end, boy, Lashem, Lashem. This gives Hashem renown. In the Hesteponim, no, Aster Asteponai, despite that, you'll see it. That's Bersumi Niso. Laos Olam, it will be a sign forever. Lo Yikores, it will always be there. Eli Me Purim. The Yom Tov Purim will be even at the end of time. The Gemara tells us that all Yom Tovim Asim Libotel, Purim will be at the end of time. What is it? So, firstly, there's a famous word from the Arizal, and the Maral explains it. It says, Purim is Kippurim, Yom Kippur is Kippur. So Kippurim, Yom Kippur is Kippurim. There's a semblance, could you imagine, the most solemn day of the year, the most serious day of the year. Their atonement, fasting, level five level areas of deprivation that we're not permitted to, to be involved in. That's Kippurim. Purim borders on levity. Drinking, rejoicing, celebrating, feasting. It's, it's the antithesis. So in what way is Yom Kippur? Kippurim. Yom Kippur is like Purim. So morale of Prague explains what happens on Yom Kippur. 
we come to recognize all year we have blind spots, we're distracted, and therefore we very often, we don't appreciate and don't differentiate between the right and the wrong. And we do the wrong. Transgress, sin, whatever it may be. Comes Yom Kippur. We introspect and we start introspecting. We do tshuva, we see, we come to a level of clarity. Yom Kippur is a moment of clarity. And because of that clarity, we fully, we, we, we do tshuva. And Hashem forgives us because of that. What happened on Purim? It's Kimu Vikiblu. At Sinai, Hashem put a mountain over our heads. Either you accept my Torah, or you're going to be buried under the mountain. That was the ultimatum. We read in the Megillah, Kimu Vikiblu. Kimu Mashikiblu Kvar. There was a reaffirmation of what happened at Sinai. It's called Kabbalah Miyavo. They reaffirmed the acceptance of Torah out of love. What happened? Of course, they saw now it's not God needs a nation. Going out of Sinai, he destroyed the idolaters, the pagans, and this and that. So people said, you know, he wants us to accept his Torah. He needs a people. Because the rest of the world rejects him. Whatever reason, they would have be forced upon us. Poor him. We were at the brink of annihilation. Literally. Moments. To annihilate them. Minar vadzokin. Tafen noshim. Men, women, children. Everybody. Not a sole survivor. And then it changed. What does that show? It shows Hashem's love for us. He will turn the world upside down. Although you think it's over, it's not over. That evoked the greatest level of love for Hashem. And they say, no, we want to reaffirm what initially we felt we were put upon, it's a reaffirmation. That's Kabbalah Miyavo. Due to the level of clarity that they came to, there was a Kabbalah, it was a reaffirmation out of love of the Torah. Now, what's the end of time? It says that all Kabbalahs are going to be botel, are going to come to an end except the Korban of Toda, the thanks offering. You know, today we do things person succeeds, he's in good health, we're thankful to Hashem for how thankful we are. You know, factually, you know, what have I gotten to position if I wouldn't have the education? What have I gotten to position if I wouldn't have the experience? And if I didn't bring my client book when I was interviewed for the, for the position, would they have given me the job? They wouldn't have given it to me. And if I wouldn't have this charisma and this personality, would have they given it to me? They chose me out of 600 other applicants. And because I have a special writing ability, what have they given to me? Of course it's Hashem. If he wanted it, I could have been denied. But you know, simultaneously, there's something, we have something to do with it. Our education, our family, our context, whatever it is, at the end of time, everything will be revealed. We have nothing to do with anything. It's like a person walking down the street and he no, 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 notices something glittering and it's bigger than the Hope Diamond. What do you have to do with it? What you have to do is bend down and pick it up. And even that Hashem gave you the ability to notice it. Because a thousand other people walked by, they didn't even notice it. So why did you notice it? Because Hashem wanted you to notice it. At the end of time, the only carbon that's is carbon to the thanks offering. People will just be saying one thing all day long. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because there's no way to deny that every aspect of our lives, whether it's our health, physical health, mental health, emotional health, whatever we have, it's all Hashem. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Therefore, all Kabbalists are seemingly bought tail except Karban Toda. What is Purim? Purim is that moment of clarity. We came to that moment of clarity. And because of that, Kimu Vakiblu, there's a Kabbalah Miyavo. Because the circumstance brought us to that. It's interesting. I mean, Mordechai and Esther, they were the heroes of Purim. If not for Mordechai's leadership, the Kimu Vikiblu would have ha wouldn't have happened. We would have been totally depressed and we wouldn't know where to turn. Because he led them in tshuva and it was due to his leadership, therefore he activated the Ness through Klal Yisrael. So the 
re- from the time of Kabul till Purim. It was, it's Bodo Rabbado Raisa, the Mor says. There's a certain, there's a disclaimer we have a right to make. It was forced upon us. After Purim, no more, you can't say it any longer. Kimu Vikiblu. Reaffirmation out of love. But who do we attribute that to? That's Morcha and Esther. It's due to their, that was their input. There's an argument where, how does one celebrate Yom Tif? It's an argument between Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi Yeshua. <coughs> Is it, and it's based on the, the same psukim, it's just how to interpret those verses. Is it, Kula Lashem Kula Chem? Yom Tif comes, you want to sit and study Torah day and night, not just, not, not not to celebrate the Yom Tif through feasting, that's your prerogative. You want to feast all day, you also have a right to feast all day. Rabbi Yeshua says, no. Chatsi lochem, chatsi l'ashem. You divide the day between yourself and Hashem. You feast, but you have to tefillah and learning. Chatsi lochem, chatsi l'ashem. But the other one says, no. You have a choice. All that or all this. But the Gemara says the three days everybody agrees, besides the spirituality, you must celebrate physically. Three days, Shabbos, everybody agrees, Bina Nami Lochem, you must be involved in Onig Shabbos. Why? Because the Torah says, Vakaros la Shabbos Onig. You should declare Shabbos as Onig, a day of Onig. Pleasure. Shavuos, everybody agrees you have to celebrate. Why? Because it's Yom Shinit the Torah of the Israel. It's the day Hashem gave Torah to Israel, to the Jewish people, even though it seems to be difficult. I mean, when we were given the Torah, that, that, that binds us to be more involved in spirituality. But he says, no, to the contrary. That's why you have to celebrate. That's why you have to feast. Everybody agrees. The third day is Purim. Everybody agrees you have to feast. Because it says, you may simchu mishteh. It's mishteh. You have to have a banquet, feasting, drinking and eating. Why? Do we look at each one of these days as independent of the other, or they all have a common thread? Now, what is the greatest accomplishment of a person's life? Achieving your goal, achieving your objective. A person was given a mission in life, and he addresses that mission. After 120 years, Hashem says, you've met your potential, you've done, you've met the objective. That's the greatest level of accomplishment. Now, what does Hashem want from a Jew? He wants what we call shleimus. We're, we, we're all potential. Every person is born, he has potential. Actualize that potential and bring about what you're supposed to bring about. That's what life is about. Now, you build a building. The building happens to be a 100-story building, but it's going to be built in three stages. First, one level, so they're called milestones. When you achieve the first milestone, it's time to celebrate. Why? You made a milestone. I reached this level of accomplishment. Milestone number one. I beat the second milestone, although I didn't finish the project. It's time to celebrate, because I completed the second milestone. And when I finished the whole project, then it's even a greater celebration, because now I've met the totality of ultimately what I was meant to bring about, the final milestone. Now, when Hashem created the world, when was the world complete? Shabbos, mm-hmm. that's the Chanukah Sabriya. Person builds a house, you have a Chanukah Sabayas. You celebrate the house, you have a house, it's complete, you move in. It's time of celebration. Hashem says, I completed a world. Now this is the setting for man to address his mission in life. That's the purpose of existence, it has no other va- value. And I finished it. Now we're ready to go. 
time of celebration, Hashem says, Karasul Shabbos Onik. You may, must declare that day as Onik. Of course, that's Shlemos. The world reached its level of Shlemos. But we read on the sixth day of creation, it says, it was Yom Hashishi. Hashem says, not so quick, not so simple. Existence is contingent on Yom Hashishi, the sixth day of Sivan. If the Jews accepted Torah, the world continues. It takes on a permanence. And if not, it reverts back to pre-existence. So although until Sinai, the world was complete, but it could have been very temporary. When did it take on its permanence at Sinai? When we said Nasim and Nishma. We accepted the Torah unequivocally. So therefore, that was the second milestone. First milestone, the world's in existence. But now it's questionable. What's going to be? If Sinai, they say, we're not interested. Or everything reverts back to pre-existence. They said, we accept. Now the world is permanent. Takes on a permanence. Okay? But how did it take on that permanence? Hashem gave us an ultimatum that we couldn't turn down. Either you accept or you can be buried under the mound. Hashem, we accept. Qualitatively speaking, it wasn't the ultimate way to accept. Qualitatively speaking. Therefore, it's a, we, we re- reach a level of completion and permanence, but qualitatively speaking, it's not the ultimate permanence. Quali- qualitative permanence. Fast forward to Purim. Kimu Kiblu. This is the ultimate quality of acceptance. Ava, out of love, it's already another level. Again, you must celebrate. Because each one of those, first it's permanent completion. Now, but qualitative, it's, then it's qualitative completion. Shleimus in the context of, of qual, the ultimate quality. Ava. Ava's Hashem is the ultimate. Therefore, again, you must feast. So when does a person feast? When you reach a milestone of completion. I'll give you an example. A boy is bar mitzvah. Until he's 13, he's not a person of obligation. He has no liability. Comes bar mitzvah. Now you've reached this milestone. What do you, you celebrate? It's suras mitzvah. Make, you celebrate. What happens when a child is circumcised, when he's eight days old? Why? Because the Gemara says that until you're circumcised, you're not a complete person as a Jew. According to one opinion, the reason why the Torah has to tell us that if a child is going to be circumcised on Shabbos, he's permitted and it supersedes the Shabbos because it's tikkun gavra, it's like a makam patish. You brought the child to a level of perfection. For a Jew to be circumcised, you're perfecting him. When you perfect something, you celebrate. There's a sudas bris. A child reaches the age of 30 days old, the firstborn. Pidgin Aben. Till 30, a child's question, will he live, will he not live? It takes on a permanence. A person is married. Celebrate. Why do you celebrate? Because that's Shlemus. That until a person marries his wife, he's not, even spiritually, he's not complete. It's not he doesn't have a home, care, home a caretaker. That's not it. A homemaker. The mother refers to a woman as an Aveda. The woman was taken from the man. He's called, she's an Aveda. He came upon something he had lost. The wife compliments him. Now you're a complete person. That's Shlemus. When you finish studying a tractate, what we call Siyum Sechta, that's part. Each tractate is another aspect of Shlemus, spiritual perfection within the person. Therefore, you celebrate. That's the understanding. Rabbi Shimon Yichoi, his students asked him, why was there a Xera, a decree of total annihilation? Why did Hashem allow such a decree to take place? That's the question Rabbi Shimon Yichoi's students asked him. So he said to them, so what do you say? He put the question back to him, so what do you think? So he said, When Ahasuerus, he realized in the third year of his reign, he made a, 
a celebration for his coronation. And he invited all the members of Shushan, including Jewish community, kosher food, kosher wine, at the most elaborate, unequaled level. Mordechai said to him, don't go. You should not go to that feast to celebrate his, his inauguration, his coronation. Do not go. Jews said, how can we not go? It's the king, this, that. And they went. So Bishim says, the reason why they deserve to be annihilated was because they went to that feast, which they shouldn't have gone. First, they why did Mordechai tell them not to go? If all the food's kosher, it's the king. Seems to be the right thing to do. He told them not to go. Rabbi Shemachai says, the reason why that can't, it can't be the reason is because if that's the case, the decree should only be on the Jews of Shushan, not on Jews who lived in his empire, which was 127 countries. But all, it was, all Jews should be annihilated. So therefore, your reason can't be the reason. So what's the reason? Neisha Polchul at Salma, when the Vuchadnezar was the, was the Babylonian emperor, he built an image of himself and he gave the Jews an ultimatum. Either you bow or you go into killed. All Jews bowed, except for three. But every Jew bowed. So because they bowed to this which has a semblance of idolatry, therefore, there was a decree. Okay, let's talk about what the students of Shem said, because they benefited from the Suda of that Russia. They said, Sudasa shall also Russia. Haman Achshvesh Russia. Now, if a person becomes a king, when do you celebrate your coronation? Immediately. It says, Mishna Sholosh Lemolcho. It was the third year of his reign. Is that when, when all of a sudden you wake up and that, now you celebrate your inauguration? That's your king. He's been king three, three years. So the Morris says, the Navi said that after 70 years in Babylon, in Bovel, you will return. So there's a question how to calculate those 70 years. Because there were different waves of exile who left Erzsel to go to Bovel. And there was a king, Balshetzar, who was a Kazdian king who was killed because he benefited from the vessels of the Vesa Migdosh because he miscalculated. It wasn't 70 years yet. He thought Hashem has reneged on his promise to the Jewish people, we're here forever. So he figured if that's the case, I could benefit. But he miscalculated. Achshver says, he miscal I will have calculation and I will not be mistaken. So what is the third year of his reign? According to his calculation, the third year of his reign was 70 years were up. The Jews should have come back. Why did they come back? The answer is, God reneged. He reneged on his promise. So now, when he's celebrating now, and he withheld that celebration till the third year, why did he withhold it? Because he may be unseated. Because the Jews go back, he's nothing. Or he's a small king. So now the third year, they're still here. The Jews are here forever. They are my subjects. But what does it say about God? He reneged. So celebrating that feast, what is that? That's celebrating the Hashem. Because the Gemara says that he also miscalculated. But in his mind, he won. God will not take them out, but God said he will take them out. Well, God changed his mind. But they were counting on it. God changed his mind. So eating that feast, participating in that feast, celebration, how do you celebrate something which is a chil Hashem? Therefore, the Jews deserve to be destroyed. On that, Rosh Hashem says, but if that's the case, why are all Jews culpable? The Jews of Shushan, the ones who celebrated, they should be culpable. Therefore, your reason can't be. But what? Because all Jews, Tom and the say they bow to the idol, to the image. So the says, said they were idolaters. So the Mara says, if that's the case, why weren't they destroyed? They shouldn't have been destroyed. They deserve to be destroyed. So the Mara says, because when they bowed, it was only lefonim. They didn't believe in it. It was purely coercion. It was only superficial. So, so the Mara says, Hashem says, as you were lefonim, as you were only superficial, 
which you didn't mean it, I also never meant it. Never meant to destroy you. It's only to put the fear of God in you. Because factually, immediately they did tshuva. Immediately, it was a kibu of a kibu. end with one thing here. It says that Hashem says, I will destroy Bavil. V'chrati v'kamti aleim v'chrati l'bavil shem u'shor nin v'nechad no my shem. I will cut off from Bavel shame, name, or nin v'nechad. That's grandchildren. Shame zeksav. That means the alphabet, the Babylonian alphabet. Sheer zeloshin. They will no longer speak Babylonian. Near zemalchus. The kingdom will no longer be that any longer. Benechet zu Vashti. That will also be destroyed. So Vashti was the last surviving relative of the Vuchanetzer, the Babylonian emperor. So Tos says a question. It says, Shor, Shor will come to an end, Zeloshon. They will no longer speak Babylonian. So Tos asks, Kosher, Shadayin him, Misaprim, Bebovel, Loshin, Arabis. Tos in his time. He says, Even till today, they speak, Ara- they speak Aramaic. So what does it mean? The Navi says the language has come to an end. So Tosa's answer is that we're speaking about a special dialect that was spoken by the, by the royal family. That will come to an end. Nobody else will speak that dialect. They speak the vernacular. But that dialect of the king is no longer. So the Maral of Prague explains it like this. It gives a different answer. Now, he says, what is a language? A language... Every language is unique to the culture. You have French culture, they have their language. You have German culture, they have their language. Everyone has their language. Now, the language itself is an expression of that culture or uh, expression of that perspective. Give me a, a Frenchman thinks one way, an Englishman thinks differently. A German thinks differently. Each of them have different perspectives. The language is the expression of that perspective. What happens if you have a case, a person's a Persian, and he speaks Aramaic fluently? What perspective is expressed through that language? A Persian perspective. Although he's speaking Aramaic, doesn't mean anything. As a result, he says that's what it means. The language will come to an end means that the language will no longer represent the culture. The Persian who speaks it, he's expressing Persian perspectives, Persian values, has nothing to do with what, 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 what the language originally represented. Totally different reality. That's, that's how he answers. So what I wanted, just to apply that, we speak about the Dora Floga. When were languages born into being? By the Tower of Babel, the 70 root nations, they built a tower to rebel against Hashem. Hashem dispersed them, but how did it start? One asked for a pail, they, didn't, they couldn't communicate with one another. One asked for a pail, the other one asked for an axe, and they got a little testy with one another, and they one smashed the other one's head, and that brought the project, project to a hold. Tower Babel, they didn't continue in the project. So the question is, we know, two people don't understand language. I mean, and they, they, they meant to bring about an end result. They could communicate through pantomime. It has to be, what, verbal expression? But they couldn't. Why? So with the morale, it's very good that if you say language is an expression of perspective, so when the 70 nations took on, each one took on another language, what happened? Initially it says, why did they, was there a consensus to build the tower? Because they spoke the same language. They all spoke the same language. Speaking the language indicates the perspective is the same perspective. So of course, we all have a meeting in our minds. 
But now that there's 70 languages, each family has a different language. What does language indicate? It's a different perspective. So we can't agree on anything because I think it's this way, you say it's differently. Therefore, that created the schism and the fighting, and that's what brought it to a halt. So again, th there's no trace of the Babylonian culture. What does it mean there's no trace? No, we have artifacts, we even have language, but the language no longer represents what it's supposed to represent. Therefore, that's what it means, it will come to an end. Mm -hmm.